How you guys doing tonight? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Deacon Greg, I'm going to have you come right up here and pray for us, if that's okay. One, two, and just be right in front there. There you go. We're going to bow our head and pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, we just want to thank you for this day. Thank you for watching us while we slept in slumber, waking us early this morning, clothed our right mind. Thank you for traveling, Grace. Thank you for bringing us together one more time. We're going to just ask you to just come into this place on tonight. We're going to ask you to just give our pastor a word to lift up a bow down head on tonight. Give him a word to heal somebody that's just going through something on tonight. We just want to thank you for our pastor and our first lady. Anything they hard desire, we're asking you to open up the windows and pour out a blessing that you say they won't have room to receive. Just want to thank you right now for BGI Church family. We're going to ask you to just continue to just yes, let us pour in, touch the hearts and their minds. Just let them know ain't a better place they can be on a Wednesday night than being sitting in front of the TV missing out on a word that God is going forward on tonight. Asking you to just give them our pastor a word to just get them up off this couch and get them back into the sanctuary. We're going to ask you to forgive us for our sins, known and unknown. Just asking you for traveling grace for our first lady. Look over her wherever she might be on her way on tonight. Look in on Jasmine. We continue to ask you to cover her with your blood. Everybody on the sound of my voice, we ask you to cover them with your blood, and we're going to ask you to just bless us in a way that we need blessing on tonight. Cover us in our finances, in the sickness of mana. We ask you to bind it in the name of Jesus. And right now, we just asking you to give our pastor a word on tonight to gift of your people. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 It's good to have you all here tonight. And for those of you who are watching online, uh, just happy to be in the house of the Lord um, as we get ready to go into this word. If y'all bear with me, I'm a little thirsty. Come on in. You walking all slow. You go sit. In, I ain't letting you sit over there. You go sit up there. That's what you get. You're in pastor's timeout corner right there. How you doing? Hmm. My mouth is a little parched tonight. I had to drink some water. Mm. Well, it's good to have everybody here, and it's good to see folks really getting back into a routine of, of Bible study. And um, it's so important that we, we really dive into the Word and really understand what we're facing today. A lot of times we... We see things going on and <laughs> and we say, well, how is the Bible relevant to my right now? I see all of this craziness in the world and I just don't understand uh, something that happened two or 3,000 years ago. You know, how does that really apply to my situation right now? We're dealing with a pandemic, right? But we know that the word is, is uh, inspired. It's an inerrant word of God. He inspired uh, human beings to write what he wanted them to write. And when God speaks in any time, it works in every time. No matter if it's 2,000 years ago, right now, or whatever. The key is if you have a relationship with the Savior, the Word of God in Proverbs 9 says, uh, or Proverbs 8 says that um, the fear of the Lord is uh, wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Knowledge of the Holy One is to walk with Him. When we walk with Him, He reveals to us what He means in what we're reading. Amen? So tonight I want to talk to you guys. There's a lot of conversations, social media, um, just about um, wherever we go. What's the biggest debate? What are folks debating about? Vaccines and masks. Last year, it was black versus white. Year before that, Republican versus Democrat. Anytime you see things escalating where people are always at one another's throat, you're dealing with demons. Demons. For the believer, the Word of God tells us something. 
about how to deal with times when you see nothing but conflict. And so I, I want to um, go to, first of all, the subject tonight is keep the main thing the main thing. All right? Keep the main thing the main thing. Let me tell you uh, why I, I chose this topic tonight. We're going to come from the book of Acts. When you have vision, when you have a focus on an assignment, a priority, if your assignment is kingdom aligned about the Father's business, the enemy is going to do everything he can to distract you from what you should be focusing on. So we have to remind ourselves sometimes because how does the enemy uh, distract us? He provokes us in our flesh. And if you are so in your flesh, your feelings, you will forget what you should be focusing on. So tonight I want to tell the believers Keep the main thing the main thing. What's the main thing? The gospel. People talking about masks, vaccinations, government conspiracies. You even have people who say they're in the church talking about, you know, how certain things are all, you know, demonic, this or that. They give more attention to the antichrist but they don't have an excitement or an expect, expect, expectancy of the Savior's return. He says, rejoice when you see these things, because when you see these things, the word of God is being fulfilled. And so I, I want each of us tonight, as we find ourselves in a season, a time where you see conflict, um, that you keep the main thing the main thing. Okay, and I, I'm, I'm going to start in 2 Timothy tonight, just so you'll know that the Apostle Paul gave Timothy some wise information. 2 Timothy 2, verse 23 through 26. 2 Timothy 2, verse 23 through 26. Can you guys hear me okay out there? Am I low? Okay, okay. You can't hear me? You can hear me? Okay. All right. Well, I'll just talk a little louder. Can you hear me now? I'll move my mic up. How's that? Maybe it's a little bit too low. Can you hear me now? Well, when you're walking, you're not supposed to be able to hear me. That's good. All right. So Timothy says, um, or excuse me, uh, Paul saying to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, 23 through 26, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. A lot of times folks are who are not sure about what they believe will want to argue with you about what they believe to pull you into a foolish debate. That's a tactic they may not even realize that see when you know who you are and you know what you know it really doesn't matter if you agree with me. I know what I know. So Paul uh, gives us some understanding. He says here, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Of course, he's talking to Timothy, who's about to go out into the world and teach. He's younger. So Paul is imparting godly wisdom in Timothy about how to go forth and share the gospel. You're going to have people who are going to, going to want to debate you about certain things. But Timothy, don't become quarrelsome. Be kind. Even when somebody raises their voice at you, be kind. Be kind. Don't get pulled in to the debate. It's always someone trying to pull you into something. But when you know who you are and you know what you know, hey, if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. What I like to do with people, especially in the body of believers, is we, we all have certain levels of understanding. Um, I, I might be at the sixth grade level. You might be at the ninth grade level. There are some things that I need to grow into, some things that I need to learn. But what I do know at the sixth grade level is right. 
but there's more that I need to grow into. You, on the other hand, who's in the ninth grade, you know a whole lot more. So what you have to do is you have to find common ground with that sixth grader. That sixth grader may know how to do some adding, some subtraction, some multiplication, some division, but you in the ninth grade, you're dealing with algebra and geometry. That sixth grader may not know as much as you. It may even say that that sort of math is fake. That sort of math isn't real. That sort of math is not necessary. But yet, you in the ninth grade, you're being evaluated on that information. It's not until the sixth grader gets to the ninth grade level that he or she will realize that this is valuable information. So the key for you is when that sixth grader wants to argue with you about this is the right way, this is the only way, and you remember you were once like that, you can also recall where you are right now. It doesn't make no sense to debate them to try to get them to see on your level as long as they're seeing on a godly level. And what I like to say is that they just haven't received a revelation yet. The revelation yet. You know, Paul himself was a very, um, he was very passionate about his cause of being a godly man. And let's just, his name is Saul before he became Paul. Saul couldn't stand them Jesus followers, couldn't stand Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ to him was blasphemy. Everything that he knew about God, that wasn't it. And so he was zealous in his faith. So while people may look at Saul as an evil person, Saul really did love God, but he had went off the deep end. And so when God used Saul and flipped him and he became Paul, that zealousness came as a result, was actually transitioned to the revelation that he had of Jesus Christ being Lord and Savior, the gospel. So I, I want you to always remember that when you're dealing with other believers, this is really a message about believers who are in the church, church folk, don't debate, don't debate. So let's just keep seeing what, uh, what he says here. The reason that you, you um, are not quarrelsome uh, because uh, it, it says here, opponents must be gently instructed. You remember I said something about being kind because you wanna win somebody. You may not win them in that moment but when God gets a hold of them at a later time, he will bring into their remembrance how you handled their confrontation. And God will show them, wow, they didn't fight me on this. They didn't argue with me on this. They, they seemed to be so confident in what they knew. What did I miss? When they ask that question, then God will show them. That means your actions during that time help facilitate the process of a person growing in understanding. That's why we don't debate. It says here, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil. We're in 2 Timothy 2, verses 23 through 26, who has taken them captive to do his will. A lot of folks don't realize that they are captive doing the devil's will. What does that look like? Jesus says you'll know, know them by their fruit. What is fruit? What is fruit, Nathan? Fruit, fruit, what, where do you get fruit from? From where? Yeah, but what is, what is, now I'm not trying to be, I'm being literal. What is a fruit? What's, where do you get fruit from? Right. How do you know there's fruit on the tree, Annie? You see the fruit, right? Without fruit on the tree, you don't know what kind of tree it is. But once the fruit emerges from the tree, you know what that tree is. So when people are in the grips of the enemy, their actions will show you 
who's really leading them. Because whatever is leading you, and if you move on what, on what is leading you, then your actions are going to either line you up with God or line you up with the enemy. Okay? The fruit. He says you'll know it by your fruit. Like he talked about people, but he, you can also look at movements. You'll know it by its fruit. You want to know what's going on in a movement, any sort of social movement, any sort of political movement, you'll know it by its fruit. And if the fruit don't line up with the word of God, then you know what's leading that movement. You cannot hide that. I hope this helps you in this time because I, I do know that a lot of people have been confused and, and um, followed a lot of prophets from all over the place who said things were gonna happen and things didn't happen. Folks got confused. Folks, folks lost relationships because you were so sure that this was going to happen because the prophet said it, but you learned that it was a false prophet. And then you try to uh, make excuses or kind of morph it and twist it a little bit. When you try to twist something, what does that sound like? What do you know that's a twisty thing? A serpent. It twists, right? So we, we just have to be able to know what we're looking at. This is so important. Listen, I could stop right here. For this church community, for those of you online, you got to know what you're looking at in this time. Because if you paid attention over the last year and a half or so, some folks thought they knew something. People who had high position, they were influencers. And they said it, and you believed it because of their position. But then things didn't happen. What did that do to you? Did you, did you have to reevaluate certain things? Televan televangelists, all of this other stuff. People you never thought, I mean, it was like, it was an exposing of all of us, all of us, okay? This is not the season for us to focus on the exposing. Everything's been exposed. This is a season for us to keep the main thing the main thing now. The main thing, the main thing. What is the main thing? It's the gospel. I know I'm kind of low because I, this is better. Yeah. The main thing, the main thing, the gospel. So I wanted to point that out to you tonight so that you could see uh, that as you navigate what is going on, don't debate, don't be pulled into foolish arguments. Keep the main thing, the main thing for your life, the gospel. The gospel is what sets you free. A lot of folks are trying to fight for liberty, right? Oh, Lord, we're being persecuted, and, and I'm fighting for liberty in the United States of America. And the funny thing about it is, as I begin to think about, I even have some relatives like that. And unfortunately, they don't realize that persecution has always been happening, but now you're feeling it a little bit more than others. Persecution has been happening for many, many different cultures in America. But now, when you sense a squeeze in your life, now, oh, it's, it's, it, there's something happening. It's always been happening. But unfortunately, some folks didn't see it, and now it's happening in their lives. So I want you to turn with me to Acts 8. Acts 8, we're going to read verses 1 through 8. And this is why it's important for us to really keep the main thing the main thing. First of all, I want to point out to each one of you that for the individual believer, the main thing, the main thing is going to be a prayer life. How many of you have a prayer life? The prayer is a nuclear bomb to any warfare that you're dealing with. Okay, so if there are strongholds in government, strongholds in your community, strongholds in your relationships, stronghold on your mind, what defeats the stronghold is prayer. God loves the prayers of the righteous, okay? 
That's, that's fundamental. If you're not praying, then you are walking around wide open. Prayer covers you, okay? All right, so let's just go to Acts 8, verses 1 through 8. And there was something that happened where the early disciples, as they got, uh, they were, they were, they, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they received the Holy Spirit and they uh, had tongues of fire and they went out and started sharing. Stephen was one of them. Stephen was the first one to be killed. And we're going to pick up the text at this point after he's killed and it reads this way. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Persecution. Persecution happened. Their liberty was threatened. What did they do? They scattered. They scattered. It was God's intent for them to scatter. Otherwise, they would have stayed in Jerusalem and they would not have done what is written in Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20, to go out into the world to share the gospel. They would have stayed in a particular area in their zip code. They would not have gone out beyond their zip code if there was such a thing during that time. So let's keep reading here. It says, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. That's what I want us to see tonight. In the midst of persecution, liberty being taken, people being thrown into jail. Those who scattered kept the main thing the main thing. Preach the gospel, teach the gospel. What is the gospel? Jesus Christ died for our sins. Repent of your sins. Believe in who he is, that he, he was raised from the dead with all power. And guess what? Invite him into your heart and you are saved. That's the good news. So they kept the main thing, the main thing. Now, in today's time, uh, as you see different people being persecuted for whatever reason, um, the enemy is the persecutor. We can all agree that Saul was not being led by God. Saul was not being led by God, although he thought he was. He thought that he had God's best interest in what he was doing to root out the Christ followers. You will have people during this time in this lifetime, and it's happened over and over again, who believe that what they are doing is of God. The Ku Klux Klan thought what they were doing was Christian. Just throw them out there because they, they're the Christian organization. But you'll know us by our fruit, right? I say us as a people, all of us. You'll know us by our fruit. So... You got people who are passionate about whatever their cause is, and they will argue you tooth and nail that they're right, and they will try to tell you how wrong you are. People who spend more time trying to tell you how wrong you are don't really know who they are. Let's keep going. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. He, he, he shared the gospel, brothers and sisters. It was uncomfortable because they still were fleeing, but wherever they went, they did not talk about who was trying to persecute them. They talked about the gospel, which sets people free. Their energy was in sharing the gospel, not what they were running away from. So when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, 
and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. They're being persecuted. The government, the, the religious leaders of that day at the temple had already ordained Paul to, Saul to go out and do this. They could have spent all their time talking about the conspiracy that was taking place at the temple. But they took their time and used their energy to preach the gospel wherever they went. If you're spending more time focused on what someone's trying to do to you, as opposed to sharing with people who set you free, that's a problem. That's a big problem. The gospel is what sets people free. The, the Holy Spirit, for those who receive the gospel, will come into the person who's willing to receive the gospel, believe it, and repent. And then the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Now, I didn't make that up. That's John 14, 26. Write that down for yourself. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. The Holy Spirit will open your eyes to what the enemy is trying to do to you. The Holy Spirit will also show you how he protected you from things you were even unaware of. So the Holy Spirit will let you know if you keep the main thing, the main thing, I got this. You will have to move to and from because they, they couldn't just stay in Jerusalem. There was some work they had to do. They had to leave. Okay. We don't, if we see a train coming towards us and we're on the track, we don't stay in front of the train and say, well, I believe in God and God got me covered. And if I don't make it from this train that's about to hit me, then I'll be with him. Remember what Jesus said in the, in the desert wilderness when Satan tried to tempt him, said, he said, throw yourself over, over the, over this this ravine and I guarantee you the angels is written will not let your body touch the ground and Jesus said it is also written that we should not test the Lord our God how many people you know right now are testing the Lord our God they're putting themselves in front of a, a locomotive coming down train tracks and they're unwilling to move because they said God got me can you imagine if Jesus threw himself over he would have been trying to prove something to Satan. That means that he wouldn't know who he is. He, he, and if you're trying to prove to somebody who you are, you don't know who you are. You got a lot of folks trying to prove their Christianity, which lets me know they don't know. Because the word says we should not test God. Amen? I hope you're getting something. I hope you're getting some revelation today. Lady Ronnie, you don't have to sit back here. You can come on up here. We got that covered. Come on up to the front. So Acts 1, verse 1 through 11. I want to read this to you. I'm going backwards. It's written in my former book, Theophilus. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He even had to convince folks he was still alive because there was, there was folks who still doubted. Who was one? Doubting Thomas, right? But there were others because it was hard for them to put their, wrap their minds around. I saw him die on that cross. And that, that's him? Am I seeing something? No, wait a minute. It's hard for the mind to grapple with something it doesn't understand, but it's right in front of them. It's a process. So let's keep going. And it says here, um, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. He continued teaching. He didn't talk about what they'd done to him. Y'all, look what they did to me. Look, they, they conspired against me. They, they, they did this and they lied on me and they tried to restrict my voice and so forth. He overcame and he kept the main thing, the main thing. He talked about the kingdom. He pointed them to the kingdom. I, I hope y'all hear me on this. 
What did Jesus do after he was raised from the dead? He spent 40 days with the disciples teaching them. He wasn't talking about what they did to him. He was talking about the kingdom. So what are we to do? We are to model and follow how Jesus handled things. We spend time talking about the kingdom, not about what someone's trying to do to us. Now, we're not ignoring the fact that this stuff is going on, but time is of the essence, brothers and sisters, for us to reach people. I just want to digress for just a second, if, if you just go with me for just a second. I got a call this morning from my gardener. This weekend, he was in my backyard while he was cutting our grass, and uh, he has three workers with him. And he called me out of the house, and I came in the backyard, and he had a 17-year-old who was working with him. And uh, I was talking to the 17-year-old, and I was like, make sure you learn how to grow your own food, like all of this, right? Just, you know, whatever. And, and uh, I said, you want a cucumber? Go get a cucumber off the cucumber plant. They're about dried up, but get what you can. And he went and got one. Um, I got a call this morning from his cousin, who is my gardener, who said he was murdered yesterday. He was killed in the community center. Got into an argument, confrontation with another person. And that person pulled the gun out and shot him and killed him. Now, I'm devastated. I don't know him personally, but here's a 17-year-old who I was with talking about, and I convicted myself because not one time did I mention Jesus Christ's name with him. I try to, I don't try to come up on folks real hard because they know I'm a pastor. I try to get to know them, try to um, build a relationship first, right? And I just, I, I didn't have a conviction of the Holy Spirit, but I felt guilty. There's a, it's different. I just like, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And I talked to his, his cousin and he said, no, no, Pastor Vince. Um, he also cuts Reverend Dobbins yard with me. And I've tried to bring him around people like you and Reverend Dobbins and others. And Reverend Dobbins talked to him about Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. What I'm trying to get to is he was standing with me on Saturday. Today he's dead. If I spend all my time talking about what they're trying to do to me and not enough time talking about the gospel, we miss opportunities because we think we got time. We don't have time. Tomorrow is not promised. That's why we keep the main thing, the main thing in every situation. Amen. All right. So he, he appeared to them over a period of time, 40 days, spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, they're still carnal. They, they think the kingdom is about a world dominance. Okay. They, they don't have the Holy Spirit yet at that moment, okay? So in their minds, when you hear about restoring Israel as the kingdom, they want to see the kings, they want to see dominance, they want to see them over people. But when you have a spiritual rebirth, the kingdom is a spirit realm where there's dominion, power, and authority that's over any and everything. That kingdom made this. So... When you restore the kingdom, it's a spiritual revival or a spiritual awakening where people no longer want this, they want that. Unfortunately, what the desire was for the disciples at that time was for this to be made dominant again. Jesus ain't trying to make this dominant. He's trying to make that dominant. And it's already dominant because demons 
bow before him. Amen? So they, they ask that question, and, and so sometimes we ask that question, right? Lord, when are you going to bless me so I can be dominant over this situation? Well, if you know who you are, you're already dominant. Listen, when you know who you are or whose you are, you walk with a Holy Spirit confidence. Doors open for you, and you don't even have to knock them down. They, things come to you, and you're like, how? Whoa. I was talking to Lorraine today at work, and we realized that if you're operating in your gift and using it according to God's will, your gift makes room for you. Because we do know in the word of God, gifts are given without repentance, which means that you have many different people who have gifts, but not everybody's aligned with God. If you're not aligned with God and you pimp your gift, it will lead to destruction. If you're aligned with God and you use your gift, it will make room for you. That's worth the whole trip over here. <laughs> Folks wondering right now, I, I look over here, spent thousands of dollars on equipment. And I started thinking about the ministries that are not operating right now because they think they don't have what they need. And God shows you, use what you have. We still have worship service, praise and worship without needing that. I'm not saying that is not important. But do you know that each one of those instruments equate to someone who probably might get paid $150 a week? If it's a gig, you're pimping your gift. If it's a calling, your gift makes room for you. Okay, let me repeat that. For those of you online, you can't see what I'm pointing at. I'm pointing at the the drums and the keyboards and all that fancy equipment that we spent thousands of dollars on. If you set a price for your gift, you are pimping your gift. The prostitute sets a price for what she or he tells. Am I correct? So you're prostituting your gift. But if you have a gift and you're doing it for God, you don't put a price on it, you just do it, and then guess what God does? He blesses you. I will venture to say, you don't even know what the true value of the gift you have. Our minds are so finite that we'll place a, a, a dollar sign on it, and you actually limit yourself you limit yourself when you put a dollar sign to the gift. That's like taking this and saying this is above God. That's, that's all it is. It's like, here's the word. We know the word is valuable. Let's just say this is a credit card, even though it's a mask. Instead of walking on the foundation of the word, we choose to take this credit card, that's our foundation, and we walk all over the word. Let me just go a step further. We're almost done. When you don't put a price on your gift, God will send resources from everywhere in what you do. I didn't make that up, folks. If you pay the musician or the preacher and the preacher says it's $200, you've got to pay me every week. Well, guess what, folks? They'll say, okay, we're going to pay you what you asked for. But if you don't set a price for what you do, you just do it, and then God will bless you. Somehow, someone might come give you $5,000. <laughs> you're not doing it for money. You're doing it to serve the Lord, and then the Lord sends resources for you to live. Oh, gosh, that's worth the whole trip. I, I, hope, some, I hope some folks get this tonight. Stop prostituting your gift. All right, so let's keep going here, what he's talking about here. So the, the Holy Spirit is the gift that his father promised. He says, what you heard me speak about. He said, John baptized with water, but in a few days, uh, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they asked, you know, uh, is this going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the father has set by his own authority. 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Folks, this is the command. Keep the main thing the main thing. Don't worry about what something's going to with where we are in time. Don't focus about that because that's that while it's important, that's not something you need to focus on. Jesus is telling him, telling all of them, keep the main thing the main thing. And when you do it, you're going to do it in all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. In other words, you're not going to stay in one place. You're going to go there for a few days, and then when these things happen, then you'll know what to do. When those things happened, they still didn't know what to do. They, they, they tried to uh, go to the temple. God wanted them to scatter so what God will do is use the persecution to scatter you to do what Jesus commanded. How many folks you see right now focusing on things, conspiracy theories, they're supposed to be in the church, but really do you hear them say repent and be saved? They're talking about what systems are trying to do to you. I used to talk like that. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, I used to talk like that. Then I had a higher level of revelation. Keep the main thing the main thing. And that's all I've come by here to tell you tonight in this Bible study. From Jesus' mouth to your ears. Keep the main thing the main thing in your life. First for you as the believer, prayer. You're already saved. So now activate the tools that he's giving you. Prayer. Prayer. All right? Uh, For those of you who may not have been here over the last couple of times, we talked about the power of prayer and what prayer does. And in Revelation 8 and 9, prayer is like incense to the Father. It's a sweet smell. And as we learned about a sweet smell, when you smell something sweet, you want to consume it. So the Father consumes our prayers, and then he acts on them, okay? That's what we have as in our arsenal, but rarely do people use it, Okay? I want you to turn with me to Matthew 28, 16 through 20, just to back up what we just learned in Acts 1, 1 through 11. This is Jesus dealing with the 11 disciples. This is on that last day. He was 40 days teaching them, and at that last day, standing on his mountain, he's getting ready to ascend into heaven, and he gives what we call the Great Commission. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. <laughs> Not one, but some doubted. They weren't sure what they were looking at. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. How many of you have truly shared the gospel with other people? It's not just inviting people to church. It's through how you live your life, how you handle foolish debates, how you handle pressure you will know how mature someone is by how they handle the pressure cooker when a squeeze is put on you will see what comes out of them so I ask you today when pressure is put on in your life do people get the gospel or do they get a tongue lashing from you The Great Commission is not just left up to pastors and bishops. How many of you are disciples of Jesus Christ? Let me see some hands. That commission is to you. That's what you're called to do. That is the main thing. If you believe it and you receive it, then you want somebody else to have it too. So as we move about in this time, Do not allow ourselves to be distracted and get pulled into what? Foolish arguments. Sometimes you just got to walk away. 
you know, the Apostle Paul says in the Word of God, if at all possible, be at peace with people. He said, if at, if at all possible. He understands that sometimes it won't be possible because folks only constantly get in your face. Just the other day, there was a reporter down on the coast doing his job. That used to be me. I used to be in front of the cameras reporting, talking about Hurricane Ida. And you had a man just pull up, come on up and argue. And then he went a step further to get into the person's face. Fortunately, that individual, the reporter, had great restraint. But I'm going to tell you something. You get up in my face, you might catch these hands. I'm going to keep it real. I'm going to put it, I'm not giving the demons a reason to come to, no. I mean, I'm going to avoid, be at peace at all, you know, as much as I can. But you get in my face, you're going to catch these hands. You get in my face and you try to assault me, you're going to catch these hands. You might catch something else. You don't know what I'm carrying. I'm just, listen, this is a pastor who believes in peace. But in this season, people have lost their everlasting mind. And for some reason, when the squeeze has been put on, you see what comes out of people. So I'm just putting everybody on notice, okay? Now, you, you can try to get in my face and try, listen, I have self-control. But if you stay in my face, you're going to catch these hands. I know my pastor's probably going, oh, Vince, I didn't tell you to say that. I'm going to send this clip to him, too. He's going to be like, Vince, you shouldn't have said that. Listen, at all possible, be at peace with people. Don't go looking for confrontation. Avoid foolish debates. You don't even need to comment on somebody's social media post. Just scroll right on by. All right? But when people start to pursue you and get up in your face and, and, and try to assault you, they, they might catch them hands. Jesus says, turn the other cheek. I'll turn the other cheek. But if I'm turning the other cheek and you keep following me, your cheeks may hit the ground. You may catch these hands. All right? I'll leave y'all with that tonight. I, uh, God, please forgive me if that is not of you. <laughs> but I, I just want you to, to really pay attention to what you're seeing and know where it's coming from and keep the main thing the main thing. Amen? All minds clear? Let us all stand. I want you to keep folks lifted up in prayer. Um, I heard the other night... Um, Tamara, Sister Tamara Jordan was asking for prayer for her daughter Candace who was in the hospital uh, and so keep that family lifted up um, continue to pray for me uh, all is well but for strength to continue to move forward you guys have seen me move forward in spite of a lot of stuff and you see us overcome in spite of a lot of stuff I firmly believe that in times when you, we had a lot of things coming at us I always kept the main thing the main thing, but I am human. I do feel. You still have to deal with how you feel, but I never stop. You keep the main thing the main thing. And that's what I want each of you to do in your life. You're going to have things that are going to come at you. You always will. Always will. But you keep the main thing the main thing, and when you look back, you're going to say to yourself, wow, I overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimonies of the saints. The saints help to share what they went through and how they overcame. Amen? Let us pray. Well, is, uh, Sister Judy, come up here. I want you to pray for us tonight. You are a praying woman. Do you mind coming and just come right there at the very top? I'll give you my mic and just pray. Pray us out of here and pray for those who are, you know, pray for our country. Pray for the world. Here you go. Father God, we come to you right now, Lord, to say thank you. God, we thank you for all the things you've done for us, all that you're doing and all that you're going to do. God, we praise your name because you're great and you're greatly to be praised. God, we want to thank you tonight for the wisdom that you have allowed us to receive. God, we ask that you just let your spirit of wisdom rest on us, God. Give us a revelation knowledge, God, of what was taught tonight, God, by the man of God. God, we just thank you right now. God, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem tonight. God, you say those that pray for the peace of Jerusalem, oh God, 
Oh, Father God, we thank you right now, God, that we will prosper. God, we thank you right now, God. We pray for world peace on tonight. God, we pray for your mercy. Oh, God, we thank you right now for mercy. God, you said in your word that your mercy is everlasting. God, we thank you for the everlasting mercy that you have. God, we pray for America, the United States of America. Oh, Father God, we pray for mercy, God. Oh, we pray for mercy, 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 God. God, we thank you right now, God, for your divine protection, for your protection over the righteous, oh God. Oh God, we thank you right now, God. For we know, God, that you said, God, that no evil will befall us and no plague will come near us. God, we thank you right now. We stand on your word on tonight. God, we pray for the sick, God, and shedding in everywhere. God, we pray for your healing power, God, to go through the hospital room, go through the nursing home, even the ones that's at home that are sick on their bed, God. God, we pray right now that your healing power, oh God, will go through them right now, God. For we know that by your stripes, we are healed. We thank you right now. We declare healing right now over our loved ones on tonight, God, in the name of Jesus. God, we even pray for the ones that are working with the sick, oh God. God, you see, God. You're the God who sees. You're the God who knows, oh God. God, we thank you right now for those that you're sending in the hospital rooms right now to help, God. God, not only that they help, God, with the physical body, that they help with the spiritual also, God. That they be able to plan a word, oh God. Oh God, like the preacher said on tonight. Oh God, that our focus shall be the word, God. The gospel. Oh, God, for we know that everything's going down, but your word going to stand. Oh, we thank you for the word on tonight, God. God, we pray for children, oh, God. God, we pray right now, God. Oh, for the youth, God, everywhere. Oh, God, we ask, oh, God, that you take care of our babies, oh, God. Protect them, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray against premature death right now over us and over our children right now in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Father God, we thank you. Oh, we thank you for the blood, oh God. Oh, we know without the shedding of the blood, there be no remission of sin. Oh, Jesus, we thank you right now. Just as your word said, oh God. Oh, for we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Because of you, Jesus, oh, we're redeemed. So we're not no longer under the curse of the law. So we don't have to suffer with sickness. We don't have to suffer with diseases, oh God, because we've been redeemed according to your word. And we will say so. Oh, we thank you right now. God, you said in your word that whatever we declare, you will establish it. We declare right now, hey, that we are healed. We're set free. We're delivered, oh God. And we thank you right now, God. God, I pray, God, for the pastor right now of this house. Oh, and his wife and his daughter. I lift them up before you right now. God, strengthen them, oh God, according to your word. God, God, let your ministering angels, oh God, minister to him, oh God, and strengthen him, oh God, in your word, God, in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you right now. I pray for every member. There's a task to this ministry. Oh, I pray for their strength, oh God. In the name of Jesus. Oh God, and we thank you right now. Oh, we magnify your name, God. We glorify your name, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we thank you right now. Oh God, and it's our desire, our prayer, God. Oh, that people will be saved, oh God. God, we know that you're coming again, oh God. We have been redeemed and we will say so. Oh God, we thank you right now. For we know, God, that time is winding up, oh God. In the name of Jesus. God, I ask that you strengthen us, oh Lord. Oh, strengthen us in your word. Oh God, you say we shall be bold as lions, oh God. We, God, must speak truth, God. The truth is your word, oh God. Oh God, you say cry loud and spare not. 
tell your people, oh God, their transgression, oh God. Oh, we thank you right now, oh God. We thank you, Father. And we magnify your name on tonight. Oh, we just glorify you, God. Oh, God, I love you, God. We love you because you first loved us. God, you so loved that you gave. God, you gave your only begotten son. And all we have to do is just believe, oh God. Oh God, I ask that you help our unbelief on tonight. Oh God, help us, oh God. Strengthen us, oh God. For you know, God. God, you know what we're going through, oh God. Nothing takes you by surprise. Hey, God. Because you're the God who sees and you're the God who knows. Oh, and we thank you on tonight. Oh, Father. God, I pray right now for those, God, that's going backwards, oh God. Oh God, I thank you right now. I ask that you strengthen them, oh God. God, those, God, that say they love you, you say you know them, God, that say they love you, but they don't. Oh God, I ask you right now, oh God, that you created them clean hearts, God. Renew the right spirit, oh God. God, we thank you right now. God, and as we repent before you right now, for God, we know that we'll sin against you and you only have we done this evil in our sight. Oh God, we ask that you have mercy on us and forgive us, oh Lord. Oh, we thank you right now and we magnify you, God. We thank you, Lord. Oh God, we thank you for all you've done, all you're doing. Oh God, and all that you're gonna do in our lives. We thank you, God, for our health, our strength. All of those that came out tonight and pressed their way, oh God. God, this thank God. Oh, Lord, we know that we got the press, hey, God, because if we don't press, we won't make it. Hey, God, oh, we thank you right now. God, I ask that you put down in our hearts, God, that we will fast more, God, because if we fast, oh, God, we'll last, oh, God. God, we thank you right now. Oh, God, in your words, you say, when we fast, when we pray, and when we give, that don't mean if, when me you expect for us to do it oh god god we thank you right now strengthen us oh lord god i thank you i just thank you i thank you i thank you in these blessings i ask in your son jesus name and so it is and so let it be done amen brothers and sisters i want you to remember keeping the main thing the main thing i also want to remind you that you can give online or through our cash app at dollar sign BGI Fellowship. Sometimes we take up our offering, sometimes we don't, but I'm glad to do that tonight for those, those of you here, those of you watching. So it's dollar sign BGI Fellowship. Dollar sign BGI Fellowship. You can also text to give at 901-244-4688, 901-244-4688. And of course, if you're watching us now, you're watching us online, uh, and you can give there as well. To God be the glory. Go in peace. I hope to see you here on Saturday or Sunday. Saturday at 11 a.m., Sunday at 10.30 a.m. God bless you. Bye-bye.